well, what does it really mean when someone's having this near death experience? Is their brain still active in some way? Is their brain completely shut down? As, where their heart is completely stopped as well? Like, Knowing what that means makes all the difference on refuting some of these arguments, because as far as we can tell with science, you know, when the brain is completely shut down, you can't hallucinate because you need the brain, you know, to hallucinate. <laughs> the brain is what produces hallucinations. They're likewise, the brain is what produces dreams. So, you know, someone's like dead to the point to where their brain is also not active. That means, and the thing about that is interesting too, because there's kind of a caveat in there. You know, we, we measure brain activity with EEGs and other like different medical devices. And if there's no activity on those machines that we can detect with those machines, then we assume that the brain is not active or dead. You know, that's interesting, too, because how far do we really know about that? That would be a counter argument. Like how how far can these devices measure brain activity? I mean, is there still some brain activity? We're just not detecting it. That's happening during the near-death experiences, or is there truly no brain activity at all, which would be a very huge anomaly that we need to try to explain. Like, why is someone seeing these things after their brain activity has stopped? It doesn't make any sense. And a lot of this comes from an independent study I did with uh, Professor Chelsham, who we had on here before. And it's also where I, I wrote more about counter-arguments against near-death experiences and then arguments refuting those counter-arguments. So the two most common counter-arguments I hear against near-death experiences is that they're either hallucinations or they're dreams. The real tricky thing about near-death experiences is trying to determine when the person has actually died. Because, you know, there's different terms thrown around, like someone died, someone's brain dead, someone's clinically dead, someone's in a coma. And they can get so easily mixed together and confused with each other that we completely lose all sense of what it even means when we're saying that someone has had a near-death experience. And it's very important to get that definition correct. Some people will say, like with hallucinations, that an increase in carbon dioxide in the bloodstream can cause near-death experiences through hallucinations because they have been, I think, studies done where ox oxygen deprivation, which obviously increases carbon dioxide in the blood, um, well, can make people hallucinate and we know that can happen. So, but again, it comes back to the question, like, is the brain completely inactive during that time? Because if it is, and they're still seeing these things and these near death experiences going above their body, going to a tunnel and all the things we talked about in the other one into the other dimension of heaven and all that, well, we can't explain that then, uh, as a hallucination. If it's not necessarily like, testable sometimes because for example when somebody dies right like you like last time we said we get quant and they come back to life we get quantitative um qualitative uh examples right and somebody might want to say like well i want uh quantitative examples like give me the hard truth like and it's kind of hard to say because it's a great area where you know the body was literally dead i think that's the closest you can, thing you can say to 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 um, a quantitative example is that you know there was zero heartbeats you know the the brain went numb you know there was no examples like you say it of energy or or any mo movement in, in the brain therefore the body was dead right or at least that's the description we have of being dead right when your your uh, brain is no longer uh, moving, functioning, and your heart basically has stopped. And it's interesting to think that your brain and your heart are what define whether you are alive or not. The hallucination one, I find, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a lot of holes in it. And the reason why is because there's certain near-death experiences, at least three. I mean, there's I'm sure there's tons more. I just off the top of my head, there's three that I can think of. But there are very specific things that happen that just don't make any logical sense calling it a hallucination. Pam Reynolds, she had all of the blood drained from her brain during her operation, and her brain was considered completely inactive. I mean, you have all the blood drained from your brain. What do you expect? She claims that during that experience, you know, she went outside her body and she was able to hear very specific things the doctors and nurses were saying during the operation. She was able to point out a very specific song that was playing during the operation because it's very common for surgeons to listen to music. She was able to describe, I think, some of the details of the operation as well. She actually thought it was a hallucination herself, but it wasn't until she explained it 
to the nurses and the staff, the nurses are the ones who were like shocked. They were like, what? Like, how could you see this when this was happening? That doesn't make any sense. And the thing is, you know, you, you one can make the argument that, oh, well, she heard it with her physical ears during the operation and maybe she misinterpreted when she had the experience. Maybe she actually had the experience when she was still somewhat alive or right before she died or right after she died. She's just thinking she had it. But the thing is, she had custom molded earpieces in her ears for the operation. So even if she was awake or alive during the operation, she wouldn't be able to hear what those surgeons and nurses were saying during the operation, which she says exact words and they confirmed it. But it's Vicky Umipeg, Umipeg, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. She was blind since birth and she had a near death experience and she saw things. She saw herself going above her body. She realized it was her body because she's never seen anything before. So she doesn't even know what any of that would look like and stuff. So it's like, how could she see all that if she doesn't even know what that's supposed to look like? Yeah. Right? She's been blind since birth. How can you say that was a hallucination, right? If in, in, in real life don't have, you know, like, for example, sight or were, had their ears covered or, or things of that sort, right? Maybe, uh, you know, it, it, this was all paid for, uh, you know, it's paid prop propaganda doctors already make a ton of money i don't know what motivation they have to make more money by publishing books other than maybe recognition or something or attention various books by doctors medical doctors that have done qualitative studies on these near-death experiences and one of them in particular con conducted his investigation in a very scientific way made it made sure that the patients didn't know why he was asking about it. So so he didn't let them know, like, hey, this is about near-death experiences. He said he was just like framed it like, so what did you experience during, you know, the time when you passed away? You know, he looked at hundreds of cases and found similarities between all of them. You know, why are these medical doctors going out of the way to not only like investigate it and take time out of their precious because Doctors are busy. Like, it's not like they just have all this free time. Conducting a scientific investigation and going through all of the, you know, tedious steps of that process, conducting a statistical analysis of it, and then presenting the data in a book, which even that by itself, writing a book takes a long time. So I just don't really see the benefit. Like, to me, the cost of doing that outweigh the benefits. Yeah. It makes money. Yeah, I can see that. Like, you know, like the, the cost would be spread the truth, basically.